Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for being here with me. Um, just a little bit more background. I am Danish. You can hear it on my accent. Um, I worked very hard on it because I've lived for over 30 some years in the United States, and this is how far I've gotten with it. And David, thank you for mentioning how many years I've been at the Geographic. That makes me um, mature. But in old days, we, um, we had child labor at that time. We don't do that anymore. So that's really good. Um, we are all here today because we all love photography. And I, uh, I want to show you a set of images that, with which I can perhaps help you elevate your photography a little bit. Um, so it's, it's both a little bit of tutorial program. I have put some of my better pictures in there because put tutorial programs most often are horrible because they're always bad at photography. But beware, if you, if you don't want to be taught anything, just look at the imagery and, and you'll be feeling pretty good about it. Um, I also, as a, as a young person, I wanted to be a photographer since I was 12 years old, and when I was 17, I got a mentor. And um, I asked her, quite frankly, if she, she knew if I had any talent, and she said, oh, you have lots of talent, and by the way, it's not very difficult. And that was a true lie, but it helped me get into photography, and so please, take the journey with me in here and kind of just look at my pictures. Perhaps they are not just the pictures you are used to. I like to be a little different and, uh, and see things from, from different angles and uh, that's what we are going to do. So it is a matter of expressing yourself um, through photography, your creativity. And I have to know. Here, it's all about our eye and what we see. And we all see different things, and that's, that's uh, the joy of it. You know, you can line up five people right next to each other and, and photographing something really simple, and they will all come out with them different imagery. And that's all how our brain is processing what we are seeing. So it's all about what you see in the world. And here, this is the way that I prefer to see the world, like a, a portrait down in water, up in Greenland, on, on a National Geographic Lindblad expedition. And this is just a, a tide water pool with seaweed in, and then a reflection. So that's how you can solve that problem. Look, look around, look all the time around. There are so many different things, and you need to kind of Challenge yourself nonstop. When you have taken one picture, and because something in your brain said that this is what I should take a picture of, there's something there, then step two is you need to work with it. You need to go on. It is not enough to take one image. So the, here are the three main components for photography for all photography in the documentary and the art photography world. And this is the light and the composition and the moment. And here's a, here's a typical example of beautiful light. I mean, I, I confess, sunrise, sunset, they're really wonderful, but there is so much other light and you need to open your eyes for that and and get going with that because like sun by sunset we all been out there it's all nice but you can be in the desert in the middle of the night and take pictures there and it looks so much different or at east timor two dolphins are mating here in this image and i had a, a good friend of mine mike nolan standing next to me and he was photographing and I'm not sure, perhaps he did use a flash and I picked up on it and therefore I got this imagery. For you, perhaps, if you looked at one of those images, you say, oh, 
I don't, it, it, it's not right, you know, why is it not exposed the right way and so on, and, and you perhaps drag it to the wastebasket. For me, it's an imagery that's unusual, and I love it. I think it has so many different components in it, and um, it was very palatable to me. Another type of light is tungsten light, like big projectors shooting up in a snowstorm, uh, and, and all the, the snowflakes were coming down at slow shutter speed. You didn't get this uh, kind of motion in it, and there all the, the different but the um, light sources had different colors, uh, red and white and blue is in there too. So look for the different light. The different light is a blue hour where an iceberg has morphed itself into be like Moby Dick. And then on top of Moby Dick are a lot of penguins. So. That's, that's a wonderful thing with mixed light here because there's also the search light from the Explorer, the National Geographic Explorer, and um, that, that makes you focus in on it. It gives you a focal point when you have something like that in the imagery. Totally different than the beautiful light after sunset, also in Antarctica, this is in the Ross Sea, um, but just where ocean and sky becomes like a canvas, and it has a painterly quality which appeals tremendously to me. And then I have some pictures here where number two element in, in the photography, uh, how to create an image, this is about the composition. And uh, I took and only took circles I took different circles from, from all different places. I was doing a story about paper, and I was in Kyoto, and I was together with a Maiko, that's a, an apprentice for a geisha, and she and I were walking out in the evening in Kyoto, and it started to rain. She unfolded her umbrella, and then for me, that was the image. Uh, I also should say, tell you that I, only instruct people in front of my camera if I'm doing a portrait. There is no other way I do it. I have a very short uh, relationship with people in front of the camera. It is like a split second. If it doesn't work, I go on. I know from experience that the world is full of imagery and I will find something else to take pictures of. In the rice fields in Bhutan, another circle I found there, the woman is bending down, her hat makes a beautiful circle. Or you also have the, the circles from the market in East Timor. You would say, well, how is it so blue on the fish? And I can tell you there was an awning on top of where the fish were displayed and the sun was shining on this awning that then was blue, reflected right down on the fish, and therefore they have this kind of a little bit surreal blue color. So just keep an eye out for the light. And also another circle. This is a, a woman wearing a hat in a market, look from, from behind, and I take pictures of people, of course, from the front, from the back, from side, from everything, everywhere, ups and downs. Um, but I just want to have something that appeals to me. And that's also about photography. The only one you really need to please with your photography is yourself. Nobody else. It's a really a wonderful thing. And I think that's why I have tried, thrived with photography over all the years I've been into it, because I have a severe learning disability. So therefore, I, I do not war, work well in groups. So therefore, I had only myself to please. And I could only compete with myself through my whole career. And that has been my key to success. This is, if you would like to know, a, a windshield in a, in a small bus in East Timor. But what was it I said? It was light, composition, and the moment. 
and the moment trumps everything. Well, um, should there be people with French passports in here? I, I mean it well when I say welcome to Paris, because it's taken in a market in Paris, and it was Sunday morning, the two women were sitting there, and I lifted my camera, took the shot, and of course, you can't run over to them and say, oh, you look so resentful for a minute ago. Could you do that again? It doesn't work, all right? Just, you get the moment or you move on. And by the way, I also became very good friends with them afterwards. I sat down and I spoke with them. I, um, I explained what my purpose was. And that, that's a way that you can also get over this thing of, of breaking the ice. When, when you have gotten the image, often it's appropriate to give an explanation for what, why were you doing this. And then I have my camera settings and they are just kind of give and take, all right? So I have, I shoot in RAW always. That's one thing. I, I really never, ever change that. And then I, um, I shoot aperture priority. And then I shoot, yeah, I have uh, my, my glasses on. That would be greater. Auto white balance. Auto white balance is fantastic. That is my favorite spot to be. Seldom do I go out of, of auto white balance because I know my camera, whichever camera I shoot with, and believe me, a lot of these stands out there I have been clients with. So. Um, a auto white balance for all the different cameras work much better than what I can do. It's like, it comes to mixed light, like uh, daylight and tungsten light together. I can't do it any better and I don't want to be bothered. And then there comes the last thing also, I, if I go into some place where there's only tungsten light and I go back out again in the streets, then at a certain time, I have forgotten all about my, my, my white balance setting. So auto white is where I rest. And then I start my day at, approximately around f-stop 3.5 or 4.5. Um, and that's something we heard a little bit about this morning. This thing about how we look, look at each other. Well, here you are, you will be my, my victim. And when I look down on you, I deliberately focus on you. My brain focus on you. And, and therefore, that's what I want to imitate in my, in my imagery. And the only way I can achieve that is with ap my aperture. I can move my aperture. When I then have like aperture 4.5, as I say here, and looking at you, I get shallow depth of field. If I look out over the whole room, it changes. My brain changes, and I get much more a depth of field, and I see everything pretty much in focus, except for I'm missing my glasses. So. Um, but they are about, and then you can imitate that also with your f-stop, with stopping down. And then you should vary your shooting position angles and use different lenses. It really works nicely. And here, this was a story I did about the Scythians for the Geographic many moons ago, and I photographed these horses because uh, the horses were a major part of the Scythians' lives and lifestyle. And I also, I knew horses. I know horses, they, they are a, a creature of habit. They hate if there's something new uh, standing right in front of them. And I knew they were coming home to their fold. So I'm, I built myself a little hay bale and then I stuck my camera out and hoped for the best to uh, push the shutter as they were coming into the fold in the evening. So that's shooting low and then you shoot from, uh, from above and down. You shoot down here on, on a, a company at, at um, the Seine River in Paris or you go all the way down to the ground. And that, um, 
The cameras that have the flip out LCD screen in the back are really the best. I mean, I have had so many kinks in my neck from being all the way down low before I got to pull out the LCD screen. And also, it's the same thing when you hold it up above you, then you can look up there and you can see the screen. I, though, through all those years, I have, I have a very fine um, feeling for how much I see. If I have like a 24 millimeter lens on, I know what that means for how much do I get in the picture. And I can shoot from, from my chest, from my hip, from anywhere, you know, left and right and so on. So, um, it, but it's nice to have an LCD screen that can tell you a little bit about how it is. You also can look down. This is at the National Geographic Explorer. That's a bulbous nose. And then at the same time, the king penguins are coming from the beach up to the ship. And then they, there are some algae that they really like sometimes to nipple on. And then they go up there. I've only seen it once, though. But they, they did it. And it's just beautiful. And king penguins are fantastic. I will have to say, um, about my career, the, the best thing that happened in my career was when I joined up with Lynn Blatt. Beforehand, I was much more a street photographer, and, uh, and also I did, I did these historical um, features. When I did them, it was always with the documentary photography as tool to it. I don't do illustrations. I really hate illustrations, but um, for, for my photography, not for anyone else. Sorry. But, um, but I, when I was introduced to Lindblad, a whole new world opened up for me. I just never seen anything like it. And, and, uh, and the naturalist on board the ship expanded my horizon so much, and I'm them forever grateful. The last 15 years has been a lot with wildlife. So thank you, Linda. And here we go. The exposure, <clears throat> that's what create the decision, the decision that controls the mood and the quality and the feel of the image. And so here, this uh, is one of my more splendid uh, slides. You must forgive me, but this is how you can you can change your exposure. You have that very important little button there, and that's a plus and minus button. You need to kind of know when you have to over and underexpose a little bit in order for you to get what you really want. Like for instance, this picture from Marrakesh. Um, if you didn't underexpose a little bit with the cameras that I'm using, then it would become milky gray and, and uh, overexposed. I also warn you about the thing about comparing notes with your neighbors. If they're standing somebody next to you that's also shooting the same picture, but with another type of camera, and you say, well, are you, how much are you underexposing right now or overexposing? And um, let me give you an example. At one time, I stood in, in the Vettel Sea together with uh, a naturalist, Mike Nolan, from the Geographic, or from Lindblad. And he was shooting with a Canon. At the time, I was shooting with Nikons. And I was underexposing for the, for the image two stops. And he was overexposing a stop and a half. So there's just no rhyme or reason. You cannot compare notes that way. And of course, it's not forbidden to look at the back of your screen either. That that's pretty good. You know, that gets a little gauging there. Uh, another one where you need just a slight underexposure. This is from Austria, from a story that I did about. Tra um, yeah, from uh, Austria for Traveler magazine. So there you have to, to also know what's happening. Five in the morning, blue hour, uh, beautiful light. You know, it's just, it's really, it's really wonderful to work in the off hours. They are just, they give so much to photography. And a story from Warsaw. I did, and the story was about those trams in the foreground. 
and a woman traveling around with the, in these trams with, with her newborn child at the time. And then it was about the communism. And so therefore you have the tower in the background and the tower is Stalin's gift to Warsaw. So it could be looming over the city forever. And so that's why these two elements are in there together. But I like motion in pictures also. It, it gives me um, a, a sense of things are fluid and, and I find it very uh, charming. And in nighttime again, also where you need to underexpose uh, quite some, it's, uh, it's in the souk in Casablanca. If you just took a regular shot of it, you would have an overexposed picture. You have to go and underexpose there. And one of these gruesome slides, again, forgive me for it, but this is a slide that kind of talked to the three elements that ex the determines your exposure, and that's the shutter, the aperture, and the ISO. And you have to mix them the right way in order for you to get a, a constant, constant is something that lives in the center of this triangle. And every single time you take an exposure, you have to hit constant, whichever way you do it. I look for patterns. There's something about patterns and the brain. We love patterns to look at them. And they come in many different shapes and forms. They come rather traditionally here in the fish market very nicely. The fish looks really good coming out from, um, from the blue there. But there are also patterns here. Patterns, and that's in the desert in uh, North Africa. And there you see the patterns of the four men dancing. And a very typical plain, clean pattern shot. And that's uh, from, uh, it's from Brazil. It's from San Salvador. And a different type of, of pattern, and um, that's also from uh, South Georgia, and that's a king penguins. Uh, Ralph taught me that there are only two types of penguins, and that comforted me a lot in the start because there are all these different names of all different penguins. And he said, well, they're either black or they're white. And here you see you have the black ones in the foreground and the white ones in the back. Thank you, Ralph. You expanded my horizon tremendously. And, um, and then here, there's in the butcher shop, you have patterns too. And then patterns in the streets. These dogs lay there in the streets of Paro in the Bhutan. And uh, supposedly, I, I mean, they, they were rather benign when I was there. And then they told me in nighttime, these dogs really turn into be monsters. And they are all over the city. And they're not pleasant at that time. But here, you know, plaza, nice, nice pattern. I love dogs. And, and another base, very traditional type of it, of patterns, it's at Tiger's Nest and you have all the prayer flags that makes the beautiful patterns. And then in the souk, there is a pattern also, and, and it's a nice way of looking out into the souk where the men are sitting. And here is the last pattern shot, then we get on to something different. And the pattern shot here is also in Morocco, and you have actually three layers of patterns in it. You have the people in the foreground. You have the middle ground with the, with the st uh, stalls, with all the oranges, and you have the patterns from all the desks in the background. So um, many more patterns, but you should also look for reflections. I love reflections. I really think those are the coolest. Here's a reflection. And that is National Geographic Explorer going through the waters of the, of the Atlantic Ocean on a day that where the ocean was totally glassy. And then the dolphins came in, and they were bow riding. And this dolphin is laying in the water right there. 
and just riding with the ship. So you see the bulbous nose down on the right hand corner of the ship that you can see where the, the water is being pushed up, the white whiteness in the corner. And then you can see on top of the dolphin, you see the reflection of the bow of the ship. So it's a little more subtle way to uh, show the, the ship and the yellow border that is painted around it. So a place that I love to visit all the time, Svalbard. I'm on my way up there. That's my next assignment to do. And uh, I, I never get tired of going there. It is a uh, wonderland itself. And uh, again, quiet day. Actually, this is in the middle of the day. And then just this total reflection of the mountains. Just, yeah. I, I got to go in a second. <laughs> and then um, here's a, a different thing. This is a fin whale. And the fin whales have a tendency of laying at the surface of the ocean in, in where they then can half sleep. They don't sleep, but they can start half the brain down and then um, hang there in the surface. And, and it was a beautiful evening and all the pastel colors in the background of the ocean is a reflection of the sky. So um, I just thought it was fantastic. And reflections come certainly to, I had been using the mirror that you can see in this image. Uh, I, had, I needed to pump some light into the barn where the woman in white was working. She was milking horses. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a drink called kumis. Kumis is something uh, that has been devoured since 900 BC, and it is fermented mare's milk. It tastes like thin yogurt. It's not something I'm going to like run all the way to Tuva to, to get. But, um, but it's a delicacy, and Luda there, the woman in white, was going to milk her horses. I had been using the mirror to just get an extra light in there. And, um, and then when the man was coming with the mirror to the barn, I saw that image and I took it. And you can see that the little guy on the, on the right hand side is really puzzled about what is this woman seeing anyhow. Um, I would also have to address something. Um, we heard earlier today about the prehistoric painted caves, and I have had the opportunity and the privilege to work in them, and, and which was absolutely magnificent. I worked in Lascaux Cave uh, for a whole story for the geographic, and, um, and I worked in Peshmer, where we saw pictures of it also early on. And um, what happened afterwards, was that there was a, 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 a journalist and a photographer from a French newspaper came to the Geographic and said, we would like to interview you because it's so unusual anyone gets to work in Lesco. And, um, and that was all fine. And then they said, we would like to photograph you with your equipment. I said, what? Yeah, you just take all your suitcases out there in, on M Street and, and we would take a picture of you. And I took the suitcases I used for that assignment. And it was 32 suitcases. I had no assistant. It was only me that carried that stuff around. And I had an epiphany at that time. I said, I'm never, ever going to do that again. Life is too short. I can't go on with 32 suitcases and so on. So I really scaled back. With my, with my equipment, and I made it as little as I could. And that's why I used that mirror, because I needed light in, in the uh, barn, and I found the mirror. I, I, I did that instead of having lights with me, and it worked. Um, and it, it, it's a thing about also sometimes you have to just know 
what, how you can solve your problems and not just say, oh, I wish I had some light, you know. Just do something. Figure out something. I, perhaps somebody is wearing a white shirt and you can use that a little bit too if it's, if you have to take it like a portrait or whatever. Um, so if the white shirt is there, you can make uh, the light brown, bounce off the white shirt. So that's good. But back to reflections, that was where we came from. St. Petersburg, um, through my career, I worked off and on from uh, 88 and then to almost to three years ago, every year in Russia, and I have loved it. It's been an amazing venture to, to be there and to be together with the Russian people. And some of you would recognize this, this um, church. It is the Cathedral of the Spilt Blood in St. Petersburg. Uh, about how did it come about? You can also see perhaps that there is a stepladder in there. Let me see. Yep, you can see the step ladder too. It is uh, the double windows, and and you know very often in the in the Russian buildings, the the windows are that far apart. When they're that far apart, the two reflections will be very different of the same thing, and that's how this picture came about. Another type of reflection again. This is from Place de la Madeleine in in Paris. It's a whole different thing. It's a, the, the woman in the foreground is actually a poster, and then it's a, the church that is being reflected in on the window on her at the same time. You can use reflections also to tell a lot. Here, this is my luxury cab. You know, the geographic always gets treated with great luxury, and, and um, this is going out to a shaman in, uh, in the jungle. I was going to go and, and spend a week together with her, and this is the way I got out there, you know, together with at least six other gentlemen sitting on the back of the tr truck for hours on end. <coughs> and reflections can also be used for filling out a frame if any of you have ever tried to photograph very elongated buildings, then you know that a reflection can solve your problem because you don't want to have all the dead space in the foreground. So when it rains tremendously and the rainwater can't drain, that's really a gift to you. Then it's out and take the pictures. And this is, of course, the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. I love to interpret my world, and I, I really urge you to do the same thing. It is, it is fantastic, and it is a privilege. You know, it's, it's just for yourself, just you, nobody else. And if you don't like the result, just put it, drag it in the wastebasket. Everything is fine. Nobody's going to judge. Nobody's going to see. Nobody's going to say. But also, you, you should also look at your imagery and and perhaps not discharge it too fast. There can be things that would be really, really good. This is um, up from, from the pass up in Bhutan, and um, only half of the group here will be capable of doing the same thing because it's from the ladies' room. But bring your camera with you everywhere you go. You must do that. When you're out taking pictures, don't just do it halfway. Do it all the way. Have that camera with you. And of course, uh, the cameras are a little heavier than others. Um, I go with the lighter type of cameras now these days. So that's it. But again, interpret your world. The monks are walking. Only the, the lower part of his leg and the foot is sharp. Everything else is in motion. How did I get that? I walked right behind them and took pictures as we walked together. You can also do it like this. Um, a little bit haunting, I would say. This is at a bus, and um, the bus stop in Casablanca. And um, I spent tremendous amount of time in buses. And if it wasn't because I found that they were very photogenic, I would be so um, 
I think I would be bored or I would have gone mad, you know. So um, I love buses. They're terrific to work in and, and um, I do it all the time. And a whole different thing, again with Lindblad up in Svalbard. And this is, this is a picture where I first would say to you, I know what the polar bear is doing. The polar bear is rinsing its fur from salt. And so therefore, it's scraping down on the snow. But for me, this picture says something totally different. This picture is a polar bear holding on to its environment. And that's my interpretation of it. And I will stand by that. And it's just like, for me, so appealing that this polar bear is expressing that feeling. So, okay, control your depth of field. Here comes another extremely brilliant picture. Um, it's one of my most favorite, not. But if you look at it, you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about either shallow depth of field, which is on the right side, and then uh, stop down full to F16 on the other side. That means it gets to be sharp from here and all the way out in the street. Um, but the result, for instance, from shallow depth of field, that's here. This is, this is it. Obviously, think about how much this picture tells you. It tells you where you are. I think most of you immediately can see where this is. Um, and if you're not, then I can help you. I can say it's Iron Pace, the pyramid on the left-hand side. Obviously, then, it's a Louvre in, in uh, Paris. And what does it tell you, too? That it is stinky hot at the same time. Everybody have to sit around the reflecting pool and put their feet there. And then it's only the feet they're sharp in this picture. It's just, but you can, you can definitely tell pictures that way. And I find it's a very, um, very good way. It gives you a great sense. Another shallow depth of field. This is here. This is at a Zong in uh, Bhutan. And I think that's, I, I, obviously I've been to Bhutan a couple of times. And um, this is my favorite picture of the Zong. And, and this is just a couple of the straws there in the middle. Uh, the grass straws are sharp. Everything else are, are unsharp on purpose. And um, for you that have been there, you know exactly if you've been there in the fall, it's a zone where they can put out the chili paper peppers on the ground. You can see the red. That's why you have red in the, in the soil too. And that they can lay it out on the ground because nobody can steal from the property of the monastery. And then, of course, a whole different type of picture from a Lindblad expedition down in Antarctica. And this is the, this thing about sharp from here to eternity. You have the, sharp, the foreground, the middle ground, and the background all sharp. And it's not that difficult. You don't need to stop down all the way. You need to stop down to F stop eight, perhaps. I, I wouldn't go any farther than that. And then fill the frame with the subject you want to photograph. So here, I filled it with the flowers in the foreground as I was at the Taj Mahal. If you've ever been there, then you know that it's far away. Taj Mahal is far away when you walk in. But then you can put that up front and then have it unsharp and then like fussy orange balls and that would be really lovely. And uh, another monastery where I certainly went in and did some very square photography. I really loved that. I also loved the light on it, so that worked nicely. There in St. Petersburg on, on a small water bus, that's a spray of the water coming up on the window of the water bus, so that's what gives it those, those um, sparkles of light. And in background, that is the Smolny Institute. Um, filling out the frame with those kind of things are very easy. When it comes to this, it can be a little more difficult. But 
I love it. This is this big humpback whale just cruising, came up right next to the Zodiac and just well, just um, was on, a, on its way. And it's, it was fantastic. It's the closest I've ever been to a humpback whale. So that was a, a, uh, with the Geographic Lindblad expedition also in Antarctica. And the little thing about just position that uh, provides the scale. And here, this is in the Kimberleys. Um, this is a true crazy woman. Uh, we were standing and talking together. And then she, she said, oh, I think I'm going to go up there and do yoga. I said, yeah, Christina, please do, OK? That's fine. The woman goes up there. I'm taking the pictures. And she jumps up in midair and it's just like, Oh, stop that, you know. It's like, but again, I don't set these things up. I don't have it in my brain, and I certainly don't want to do it either. It, it is not a part of my universe. So you see, photographing people, that's what I love to do the most. And it requires patience, sensitivity, and getting close. And sensitivity and getting close is very difficult to do um, with respect. And I think, keep that in mind, you always have to respect to the people that you're taking pictures of. And I have, um, I have a strange thing. I have kind of an invisibility cloak in where I can really get close to people without their noticing me and, and taking the pictures of them. And then this is from Berlin standing and waiting, that's something you need to do too. You need to wait, you need to find a good spot and stand there and wait till it all comes together. And you, you just simply can't come in and just, oh yeah, this looks good, I think I want to get a picture of this. Jump, jump. Okay, and then on to the next, on to the races. It doesn't work like that. You have to work it, you have to wait, you have to be patient, you have to also recognize when the picture is in front of you. Uh, a banister on his way to Palais de la Justice in Paris. And um, yeah, that, that can be, I, I love these kind of pictures. This is like, he is on solid ground. He is working, walking on solid ground. And behind him, that's a, that's a painting there's on the wall, it's a wall to fence in the, the, the place where they are, use, they are using it for all the, the work that they are doing at Place de Vendôme. And luckily for me also, his red map, his folder is corresponding to the redness in the, in the barrel build. But I love when it, you have to kind of decipher an image, stay a little longer don't just go on to the next one. Um, this woman, I, this was one of those images where I really did not have a chance to take my camera up to my eye. She came walking, she, as you can see, I had people blocking the view as she was coming walking, and then it's a late in the evening, and she just stepped into where I could take pictures of her, and I followed her with my camera. I had the camera down on my chest, and I got one frame. And again, you can't do it over, so it, this time, one frame or forget it. And this is with another type of people shot. I was in a bus, and the, the troop transport went by me and some of the soldiers, the Russian soldiers, were sitting in there and passing by at the same time. A short meeting was between me and her. She knew I was taking pictures. I had been standing in the same spot. She came at me. It was a very windy day. And I thought it was an amazing way that the hair was coming down in her face. She knew that I was going to raise my camera up. She walked towards me. She looks in the camera, and she passed right by me. But she knew what she gave me at the time. Another way, always have the camera with you when people meet each other. And uh, this man was very infatuated with the woman that I was having lunch together with. He was coming out of a restaurant, so it was all good. 
or the young boy, he also had seen me work. He came from one second, we never spoke, nothing. He just stood there. He, I can't say he even looks uh, very forthcoming, but I think he was measuring me out. I took the picture, he walked away. So that's, that's a kind of imagery that I really, really love. And it's, it's a way that uh, I have these split seconds of meetings with strangers that gives me something very special. I, I would just, uh, as the last picture of, of, of people photography, I, I love to photograph children. I do it very seldom because now these days it's really, really a touchy issue, but I had gotten, I saw her laying there asleep and her mom was working in a pool hall and I went over to the mother and asked her if it was all right to take a picture of her daughter and she said yes. So that, I, I loved it. I, I think if that isn't innocence, I don't know what it is. And just the last couple of slides, I will tell you this thing. Uh, for me, photographing man, woman, or beast, or ant beast, um, it's pretty much the same. It just is something you have to be really fast. You have to know what you're doing. You have to have your camera all set. You have to be familiar with your camera. When you're buying a camera, by the way, what, what camera are you going to have? All right, well, I'm gonna have a Nikon. I'm gonna have a Canon. I'm gonna have a Sony. Okay, it's all good. Excuse me out there, but all these cameras can do pretty much the same thing now these days, and they're really good at it. It's what feels good in your hand. It is how you can turn the dials. That's the camera you should have, and not what Uncle Tom said that that he recommended highly, all right? Just, just so you know, it's what feels good in your hand and what you can easily operate. So there's a woman and a beast uh, at Machu Picchu, really fast, she was taking a selfie. The llama was not very much into it at all. It just tried to get around her. But I was standing there and just, I saw this situation coming on and then, here are humpback whales, they are bubble feeding, and, um, and it is a beautiful sight. Gorgeous, gorgeous to look in their mouth. Then I will have to say, this beast here is not good to photograph eating. It is, it, uh, we pretty much do not look so great when we eat. There are, there are a few exceptions to it, but I way prefer to photograph animals eating. It's a lot more fun. Or the little penguin, the Adelie penguin that's been eaten by the ice beast. That's also pretty good. I like that. And here is the polar bear jumping. And you have to be there. You have to know what's going to go on. You know when the polar bear comes walking. This is from a trip in Svalbard uh, with Lindblad Expeditions. Really wonderful. You know, the pair was coming all the way up to the ship. And that's what is going to happen. But it's the same thing here. You know, you stand there and you wait. And this is, these people are going to jump too because they're not going to have uh, wet feet. You know it's going to happen. This is um, a situation you, de you can't create. Um, this is two kittiwakes, and they are diving for polar cod. And <clears throat> one just came into the frame. You have to be a little fast in order for you to, to get that shot before it's over. Um, and this is, of course, full frame. So that's how you see it. But there's similarities here. You know, it's the same thing. The, the Polish woman at the wind, wind park that was out having her pictures taken for her wedding for, um, day. And it's like the wind comes up and the, uh, and the veil moves. She's, uh, of course, in a romantic mood, so that's good. And then the black-browed albatrosses as one comes and relieve, uh, relieves the, the other ones on the nest. You know, they take turns to hatch the egg. They greet each other and say, oh, hi, yeah. Oh, okay, I take over now. This is good, all right. 
see you later when you have gotten something to eat. But it is just like us. We do the same thing. We greet each other in a wonderful way when we have very positive feelings towards each other. And then if it's like you're looking down at a ballet dancer um, on the floor of the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen as she's dancing or at performance, and also I will have to say, be careful, I almost dropped my lens shade right down at it. It was not good. I was up on a catwalk up over the stage, so it's just yeah, beware when you do stuff like that. But the same kind of feel comes from the, from the Barrier Reef, uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Same thing. Or the guy that for no reason when I'm sitting there comes right up and look at me when I'm taking pictures. So I take a picture of him too. If you step into where I'm, I'm taking pictures and it fits me, of course I take pictures. And then this is the same thing. You know, the eye contact. Enjoy it. it it's man, woman, beast. It's all the same. Or the big picture in Pamplona. Don't ever go there. I've been there. It's not good. Okay. It's, um, well, it's pretty dangerous. Not for what you do, but what for the guy ahead of you is doing. They have been out drinking all night long. That's the, the guy that's going to cause trouble. But it doesn't look much different than going to St. Andrew's Bay, photographing penguins, king penguins here. The, the uh, brown ones are the, the ones that are newly hatched. And here the, the, the newly hatched penguins also, together with a woman. I, I think they look so much alike. I know she would not, I mean, she didn't have any idea of that her hat was fitting so perfectly well into this situation, but so it is. And the penguin, uh, looks a little upset about the situation. Um, I don't know if you if you know Wallace and Gromit. I love Wallace and Gromit and the evil penguin. The evil penguin shows up in so many of my pictures. I love it. I have I have a whole other set. And um, there is a pilgrim, the pilgrim in Lhasa, with the very dirty feet. You know, as he is getting to the monastery, and that his feet are, are dark underneath, and so are the, the Gentoo's feet. So that's it. But I hope you have enjoyed it. I have, and thank you for your attention.